Well, if you have your copy of God's word, open up to the book of Exodus. We have been in a series, if you're joining or you've been out for a while, we have been in the book of Exodus for a few weeks, and we have come to the point where we have seen an entire nation suffering under the oppression of an evil king, Pharaoh. And now we are at a chapter, at a point where we've moved from the individual experience of exile of Moses to now we are going to hear what the Lord is going to do about this. We closed last week, chapter 2, 23, 25, with the reminder and the promise that God hears and is ready to respond. And now we'll offer you this today. Our God is a dangerous God. He's a dangerous God, but he's not dangerous like dynamite and he's not dangerous like disease. He's dangerous because each and every one of us at some point is going to have to reckon with the claims that he makes about himself. Each and every one of us is going to have to reckon with the question, who do you say that I am? And our answer to that question is dangerous because it determines who we are ultimately in our most inward being. Because either we can hold on to our lives in this present age and lose them, or we can lose our life and gain life. God is dangerous because he's either our judge or our defender, our foe or our friend. Either he is, as the word of God says, for us, or he is against us. Moses in our text is going to meet the creator of the universe, and he's going to learn how the Lord remembers his Covenants. And Moses is going to learn that this creator is somebody who speaks and he acts. And he's also going to learn that this creator God is different, effortless, effortlessly bending human history to accomplish his eternal purposes and overwhelmingly powerful in what it is that he wants to accomplish. He's also going to see that he's insufficient for the task, that he doesn't have what it takes, but that God himself will go before him. And he does not ask his people to go alone. If you don't already have your Bibles open, please open the book of Exodus. I will be reading Exodus 3, chapter, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked and beheld, behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why this bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called out to him from the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And then he said, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet for the place you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said to him, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their suffering, and I've come up, and I've come down, excuse me, to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians and bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Pezzarites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh and you will bring my people, the children of Israel out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he, God said, but I will be with you. And this will be a sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. To this point in our narrative, I don't know that there are textual clues that Moses understands that he is about to be set on mission in some ordained plan for his life. But God is going to interrupt him and his life and set him on mission. And God will interrupt you the course of your life to redeem you and set you out on a mission. Verse two, uh, chapter two, verse 22, we see that Moses is a man away from his people and away from without a place. Chapter two, verse 22 says, 
that he sees himself as a sojourner in a foreign land. He has built for himself a very stable life with Jethro living amongst his kinsmen. He knows that he's an ethnic Hebrew. He carries daily reminder of the covenant sign on his body. And yet, unlike God, he is not remembered as people. For whatever reason, he knew that he grew up in the house of Pharaoh, but he has not returned to Egypt, we presume, for fear of death. He knows that his brother Aaron, his sister Miriam, and his mother Jochebed are struggling under the weight of Pharaoh's oppression. And here he is, shepherding a flock in Midian, and he's led that flock into the wilderness. Whatever zeal Moses once had, whatever zeal was in him that made him strike the Egyptian seems to have evaporated. It seems to have evaporated. A harsh word from the person who he was trying to help has squashed any zeal in him and he's fled the country. Moses has built a life. He's content, a really good life, a life free from Pharaoh's oppressions, but he's away from the people and purpose of God. But after all, he's got a, he's got a kid. He's got a wife to think about now. And perhaps, you know, somebody in your life who maybe once had a great zeal for the Lord, maybe a great concern to honor and live for him. And for whatever reason, that zeal has evaporated. Maybe a harsh word from a coworker who made you the judge over me. And that was enough to shut that person up forever. After all, the guy's got a mortgage to pay. He's got a wife. He's got a kid to think about. Stephen Murphy sent me a, a meme this week, very appropriate. And uh, as a quote from C.S. Lewis, it said, prosperity knits a man to the world. He feels that he is finding his place in it while re really the world is finding its place in him. God is a dangerous God to Moses because he's going to interrupt the course of Moses's life and set him on mission. He's dangerous for us because he's dangerous to our comfort and our safety. Moses is going to learn that the God who created all things is going to marshal all things to bring his people out of oppression, out of Egypt, into the promised land. And God will redeem you by coming down to his people. He's going to redeem a people for himself. But he's also going to redeem you by coming down. Look here with what he's doing here. Verse, verse one, it says he's shepherding the flock. He's tending his sheep when an angel of the Lord, verse two, appears to him in a fire in the middle of a bush. Real quick note, this God, whoever he is, we don't know his name is Yahweh yet. We know that because we have added advantage of reading ahead. Moses doesn't know his name yet, but we're learning right now about this God, that this God doesn't need to get Moses into some hyper-spiritual, catatonic or ecstatic state. He doesn't need to take him into a pagan temple, get him pumped up with hallucinogens like the pagan Egyptian gods, right? Uh, he, he does not need to be in a trance or anything. Moses is working. He's shepherding sheep, not a very spiritual task. And the Lord appears to him. I'll return to this in just a moment, but uh, he, he appears to him on the mountain of God. Um, this mountain is where God is going to meet his people. And uh, Moses wants us to see here, and then we'll see later a connection between this moment, the mountain of God, where he's naming it this, uh, because later uh, this mountain is going to be renamed Mount Sinai. And Sinai sounds a lot like the Hebrew word for bush, sine. Now, this is a wild scene and deserves a lot of attention. So first, let's talk about this fire in the middle of a bush, okay? Let's read Exodus 3.3 and just remind ourselves again. Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why this bush is not burned. Moses is a normal guy. He's a normal guy who sees a fire and he's attracted to it. And he's an even more normal guy because he's looking at it and he's seeing the wood of this fire the wood of this bush is not being consumed by the fire. In the Hebrew, it says the fire is not eating the bush. He's a normal guy. He wants to know why is this happening? Whatever the fire is, Moses recognizes it's abnormal completely. What he doesn't realize is what he's actually seeing. Now we have a leg up on him because fire is a very important symbol in the Pentateuch, but Moses hasn't been inspired by God to write the Pentateuch yet. He's not written all of this down. He's living it in real time. But what he doesn't know and perhaps has heard, but he certainly hasn't read like we have, 
that fire is an important theme throughout that represents the presence of God. So think with me about Genesis chapter 15, seven, when God puts Abraham asleep to enter the covenant with him, what is God's presence represented by a smoking pot and a flaming torch passing through the cut animals. Okay. Genesis 19, God's angels call down God's judgment and it's the rep it's represented by what fire and brimstone falling down on Sodom and Gomorrah. And throughout the book of Exodus, fire is going to be a symbol. We'll talk about this in future weeks, but fire is a symbol for the presence of God. The people are led at night by what fire Isaiah. What is it that purifies Isaiah's lips? a fiery coal. And of course, John the Baptist talks about Jesus Christ. What is Jesus Christ baptized with? Not just water, but fire. And at Pentecost, the people receive tongues that rest on their heads like fire. We'll have more time again to talk about this, but this bush is not what's important here. In fact, the word, this, this word bush doesn't ever occur again in the Old Testament other than Deuteronomy 33, where Moses calls the God who dwell, he says he's the God who dwells in a bush. But what's important here is the fire. Important here is the fire. Fire usually consumes wood, it eats wood, and yet this one isn't. So he moves in closer. Why bush? We'll pause here and just answer this question for a second. Why bush? Why? Um, commentators have no clue. And sometimes it's really important for you to hear that commentators have no clue. Again, the only other place this word is used is Deuteronomy 33, where it says, he who dwells in a bush. Not helpful, right, for determining why it's a bush. Who knows? But it's healthy for us to say that occasionally. We don't know why, but the Lord has done this. What's important is the fire. And there's something unique about this fire. It suspends the forces of nature. This fire is unique. There's something special about it. Most special thing about it is it's a fire that talks. So let's talk about the fire that talks. Okay. Verse four, when the Lord saw that he turned aside, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses says, here I am, Lord. Here I am yet again. The Holy spirit wants us to see the inspired word of God the role that Moses has been prepared to play in leading the people of God out of Egypt. Where else have we heard a name called twice? Genesis 22 to Abraham. After hearing these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, what is Abraham's response? Here I am. Genesis 46, God speaks to Israel in a visitation. Jacob, Jacob, what does Jacob say? Here I am. And then later for Samuel, 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 speak, your servant's listening. There are even echoes of this in the New Testament. Can you think of one? Acts 9, Saul, Saul. God is getting Moses' attention. And most of the time when these things occur, it's when somebody's life is about to be interrupted and they're going to be sent on mission. Saul, Saul, sent on mission. Jacob, Jacob, sent on mission. Abraham, Abraham, sent on mission. Moses, Moses, no more shepherding. You're now going to go to Egypt and shepherd my people out of Egypt. Now details matter here. Um, your, your English translations are wonderful and, and they, they really are perfect. They're a perfect translation. But if you scratch on the black ink a little bit here, there's a little bit of color here uh, that, that Moses includes when he writes the, the, the Hebrew down. He puts an extra syllable. Uh, because he stutters. It's more like, yes, sir, uh, a little nervous. So uh, here I am is a great translation, but he's, he's nervous because he's come in contact with something he's never seen before. God has called out to him as well. He's coming to him, but then God tells him to stop. He tells him to stop. Why? Well, the text says, because the ground is holy. And what does it mean that the ground is holy? We're going to spend a ton of time talking about holiness in the book of Exodus. But let me offer a condensed explanation here. God's holiness, we often hear, is related to his otherness. And that is exactly right. Okay? That's, a, that's exactly right. But not in a cool detachment. That God is holy and just somewhere out there. God's holiness, when we talk about holiness, is to talk about who he is in himself and how he acts. So John Webster helps here. He's a wonderful theologian, one of my favorites. He says this, quote, to talk about God's holiness denotes the majesty and singular purity with which the triune God is in himself and with which he acts towards and in the lives of his creatures. Or as Psalm 145 says, 
The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all and his mercy is over all that he has made. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever. He is holy because he acts like this. Holy different, absolutely. But uh, with representation to his purity and his majesty. And there's something unique about this too. Again, the details of the text matter. The wilderness that he's in has been made holy somehow. You think back in the book of Genesis, wilderness is not holy. It's unclean. Holiness is, uh, is inside the camp. And in fact, when the high priest will place their hands on the goats to send the sin out of the camp, they send the goat where? Into the wilderness, right? They send the goat out into the wilderness. Wilderness is, is unclean. It's where if you commit uh, accidental homicide, you run to the wilderness, to, to one of the sanctuary cities. But this wilderness to which Moses has led his sheep, something special about it. This wilderness has been made holy. Holy, why? Because this God who comes down to save his people, this God who speaks and expects people to listen, he makes things holy by his presence. Victor Hamilton pointed out this, if God can transform unholy ground into holy ground by the glow of his presence, might he also not be able to transform Moses's unholy life with his presence? Might he not do the same for you with his presence? Why take off the sandals then? Nothing unclean can come into the presence of God, of course, but I I would suggest it's mostly symbolic. The sandals aren't really the problem. Moses is the problem. And he's learning here that this is a God not to be trifled with. And, And I think this is a moment for us to express a problem that we have in modern American low church traditions that we need to explore for our own sake. I think we have a disease in our tribe, our big tent tribe, where we really believe we can casually stroll into God's presence on our terms. That we hear the call of God and we just think we'll just casually walk up into the presence of God as if there's no moral requirements on us. We can do whatever we want. God needs me. He needs my presence. God does desire your presence, but there's a difference between him needing your presence and him desiring your presence. What we learn from this text is that God will be approached on his own terms. He has called Moses to himself. And yet when Moses moves towards him, God immediately begins to give instruction on how he is to be approached. There's a lot of causes for the way that we think about this, that we're very casual understanding of how we can approach God on our own terms. But it's, it's really a, a fault of theologians who domesticate God, making him small because we're offended by the idea in our modern sensibilities that there is a God who makes moral claims over our lives and tells us what is and is not right for us to do. And they're unapologetic about their embarrassment about those things. And that trickles down eventually. The truth is, it's not one of us is going to casually stroll into the presence of God one day, any more than Moses could stroll into the presence of this holy bush here. So what is our hope, right? The brothers and sisters, that actually is what makes our salvation even more incredible, right? Because in your union with Christ, you become God's and God has become yours. And in fact, uh, your eternal destiny is linked to this son of heaven and his work. So on the day when you sheepishly see your works at the last judgment and you come to heaven, knowing that you really don't deserve to be there, uh, you'll hear a voice thunder from across the chamber. He or she is with me. He or she's with me. And you don't have to take off your sandals. In fact, you get a pair of sandals, you get a robe and you get the household signet ring. But if you aren't in Christ, please hear me today. You cannot stroll casually into the presence of God. You need a mediator. Pharaoh is going to learn that the hard way, but there is time for you today while the day is still called today. So we're seeing here in our text that this is a God who comes down and he speaks and he expects Moses to listen to him. Moses is undoubtedly overwhelmed at this point, but God has something to say and he is also Kind. So the third thing we're going to see is this isn't really a fire. It's the Lord God who can suspend nature, but is known by his act of making relationships. 
God's completely sovereign over fire, but he's known not by that, but by his making relationships. Unless you're a high school student, you probably have not spent much time recently thinking about ancient gods and pantheons, right? But if you're studying Greek mythology or Egyptian history or modern world history, you are thinking about some of these things. But if you think about what the gods of the ancient world are like, they're capricious, they're selfish, they're despotic, they demand your body, your blood and more and give nothing back to you. They certainly don't care about individuals unless they bring something heroic to the table, but not this God. This God Moses is learning, this God's different because he knows names and he wants to be known as the God who knows names. Pharaoh, how, Pharaoh's household where uh, Moses undoubtedly grew up, he would have heard about Ra, the God of the sun. Hapti, right? The God of the flood. Osiris, the God of the underworld. This God wants to be known as the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, the God of Isaac. Exodus 3, 6. He is the God of relationships. Moses is going to learn too about this God, that this God will redeem you through a mediator. We're going to learn here the ordinary patterns of deliverance that God will do is he will send someone who will act on his behalf. So Moses, again, to review, has learned about this God. This is the God that comes down. He's the God that comes down. So he's not confined to heaven, but he's something more powerful than the Egyptian gods because he can control elemental forces like fire. So he's something different than what he learned about as a child in Pharaoh's household. He comes down from heaven. He's also learned that this God speaks and that he wants to be heard. He expects to be heard. And he's never like the Egyptian gods who demand, but don't tell you what they want. He's clearly saying what he wants. Moses is also learning that this God knows names. This would have been perhaps the most disorienting thing to an Egyptian worldview. This God knows who Moses is and who Moses' fathers are. And this God is about to send Moses to represent him to Pharaoh. The idea of a mediator, by the way, is not absent from the Pentateuch. There's clear precedent for this. Even the language in Genesis, the creation narratives, has language of representation, that God, God has people who represent him on the earth. God also supplies a ram to Abraham so that Abraham would have a substituting sacrifice, somebody to go between Isaac and the sacrificial table. But here the task is explicit. There's no question what Moses is doing. Look with me in verse 10. Verse 10 says, Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you will bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Why is he sending a mediator again? Because Pharaoh is crushing the people. He's sending against them. They want to worship the Lord. They're not free to worship the Lord. The oppression is breaking them. They've cried out to the Lord and the Lord is moving towards them because of his covenant. Moses is being redeemed to serve God on mission and you are redeemed for the same. God brings the people out of Egypt, he says, to serve him. Serve him how? He doesn't have a need. He doesn't need any service, right? Service to the Lord is participation in his work and will to bring all things into reconciliation to him. Service to the Lord is making disciples of all nations who make disciples of nations. I think one of the most stunning things about this passage in this moment is something that a commentator points out, Victor Hamilton again. All the promises that God lists out here in Exodus chapter 3, 7 through 9, God also gives later to Egypt. That's because God does not discriminate in his, in his redemption. Psalm 145, again, the Lord is near to all who call on him whether you are an Israelite, whether you are an Egyptian, whether you are an Alabamian from Huntsville. Listen to what Isaiah 19 says and tell me this doesn't sound just like the promises God is giving to the Egyptians. This is to Egypt. It will be a sign and a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. When they cry to the Lord because of their oppressors, he will send them a savior and defender. The ancient enemy of Israel gets a defender and a savior. 
More than that, the Lord will make himself known to the Egyptians and the Egyptians will know the Lord in that day and worship with sacrifice and offering. They will make vows to the Lord and perform them. And the Lord will strike Egypt, striking and healing. And they will return to the Lord and he will listen to their pleas for mercy and heal them. Blessed be Egypt, my people, the Lord says, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. What kind of God does Moses serve? He's not a capricious God. He's not vindicative. He's not unforgiving. He's a God who comes down to redeem his people, to visit them in their sadness and their their sorrow, and moves towards them to deliver them. He's a God who speaks and expects us to listen, expects Moses to listen, expects us to listen. And he's a God who knows names. And friends, if your messianic expectations are not at like plot climax, then we're missing the point here, right? Because ultimately this God himself who comes down, who speaks, expects to be heard and knows names, right? Does so remaining what he was, he became what he was not taking on human flesh. God comes down to save sinners for himself. And because he is God, he sanctifies all unclean and unholy hearts in which he makes his habitation. He is, his sanctifying fire is dangerous to the sin in our hearts. This God, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not one to be trifled with. And whether you meet him when you're shepherding your flock or you're finalizing your spreadsheets, the claim he makes for your soul is still the same. And it's still one you must reconcile, reckon with. Who do you say that I am? He loves you too much to leave you brothers, sisters in the Egypt of your own sin. And he loves you because you are a terrible ruler of your own heart. You're worse than Pharaoh was within the kingdom of Egypt. He will hear your cries and move towards you. His sanctifying power will burn up the sin within you and he will make his habitation within you, sanctifying you to himself. You need this Jesus. You need this Jesus. And our neighbors need this Jesus. Moses is not, does not have this dramatic encounter with the Lord so that he would just put a basket over the, the light that was just lit within him. He sent back into Egypt to bring a people out. So for those of us who are comfortably living, Zach Carter too, this was a terrible sermon to write in a way, a dangerous sermon to write, because of course I'm thinking, Lord, in what ways have I lost my zeal? I know what I was like when I was 19 and Lord saved me and I had a particular zeal. I still might have too much sometimes, but I know what that was like and I know what I had. And it's a dangerous prayer to pray, Lord, make your habitation in me. Lord, let your fire consume within me the things which have made the world take hold of me. So I'll simply ask as I close, have we forgotten that our mothers And our sisters and our brothers are trapped in their own Egypt of their own lives being crushed. Or will we content ourselves to have our hearts lit by this holy fire and then place a basket over ourselves? I would hope not. And I'm praying that God will interrupt the course of all of our lives. So we set out for mission for him. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for the example of Moses and how you are in him pointing to a greater savior in him. You're pointing to Moses is imperfect. You're pointing to the one who comes down, who speaks, who goes, who goes into a metaphorical Egypt uh, to crush sin on the cross. I don't know, Lord, what, how we have perhaps wandered in our own shepherding and forgotten about our, family back in Egypt, maybe we're suppressing the thought of them, or maybe we've just forgotten, but Lord, I pray that you would awaken us to that, to the knowledge that increasingly our city turns us back on you and they are going to crush themselves under the yoke of their own oppression of their own hearts. So God, help us to have a people, to be a people who have compassionate hearts and will move towards them and and share the good news that you are reconciling all things to yourself in Jesus Christ. We pray in his name, amen.